uh, would like to uh, welcome everybody this afternoon uh, to the Johnson Shoyama Graduate School of Public Policy's fifth annual Houston Lecture, The Mirage of Universality, Building a More Equitable and Resilient Health System, featuring Dr. Andrew Bazzari, the founding executive director of the UHN Gattuso Center for Social Medicine in Toronto. Welcome everyone, my name is Andrew Bond. I'm a Master of Health Administration, recent graduate student, uh, just completed uh, this early winter, and I'm the medical director of an organization called Inner City Health Associates uh, here in Toronto, where I'm located. I'm honored to be your MC today for the Houston Lecture, and particularly for an event uh, and discussion like today, we all know that we are facing profound crises in our health system with mobilization at all levels, primary care challenges with over six and a half million folks without access to care, and huge amounts of both attention, concern, distress, need, and a time for rejuvenation, a refresh of our health system to ask bold questions about what health systems are for and how we can do better than we have done because we need to, and this is exactly one of those level set discussions that we're going to have here today and hope aligns with everybody who's involved with the MHA program and beyond in the public policy, health policy space. I'd like to acknowledge that today, while this event's taking place online, GSGS is a physical home is located on the Treaty 4 and Treaty 6 territories, the original lands of the Cree Ojibwa, Salto, Dakota, Lakota, and Dakota, and the traditional homeland of the Métis. I'm joining from Toronto, I'd like to acknowledge that I live and work on Toronto lands that are the traditional Indigenous territory of the Wendat, Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabek, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit. I also recognize the presence of contemporary Indigenous peoples in Toronto. These territories, territories were, are, and continue to be a meeting place for many Indigenous nations and beyond. Tonight's speaker, Dr. Andrew Bazzari, is joining us from Toronto as well. And we're glad to welcome those of you joining us today from across Turtle Island, and make this acknowledgement as a marker of our reconciliation or commitment to reconciliation and gratitude to those whose territory we now reside on or are visiting. I encourage you to take a moment to reflect on the land that you reside on and think about and express gratitude for the place and for the people who have safeguarded it throughout time. If you feel comfortable, you are welcome to share your personal land acknowledgement through the chat. And if you do, please think about actions that we can do to identify and engage in further commitments to reconciliation following on the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation just recently. As we know, that work continues day in and day out. Knowing that we have guests joining us from across the country, I'd be remiss if not to say a few remarks about our event host tonight, the Johnson Shoyama Graduate School of Public Policy, or JSGS. JSGS is a national hub for advanced study and research in public policy and administration. With campuses at both the University of Saskatchewan and the University of Regina, JSGS's graduate and executive development programs build knowledge, skills, and competencies for success in government, nonprofits, cooperatives, and credit unions. Nationally recognized for our professional training and research excellence, JSGS is responding to the needs of the public sector partners, including First Nations, Métis, and Inuit organizations, governments, and communities who are confronting economic, social, and environmental issues. One of JSGS's research areas that speaks particularly to me and likely many of you joining us is the school's focus on social policy and inequality, and more specifically that as it pertains to health policy. Through events like the Houston Lecture Series, JSGS is able to bring together thought leaders, academics, students, and community members to listen and learn about current issues affecting Canadians in profoundly important ways. Before I turn it over to JSGS's Executive Director, Dr. Lillian Birdall, I'd like to take care of a few housekeeping items that will help to get, hopefully have the event run as smoothly as we can in this virtual world. We kindly ask that all attendees stay muted and turn off their video um, if you're doing anything distracting, but you're welcome to have it on if not, uh, of course, um, and certainly have it on for the Q&A portion of the event. If there's any logistical issues during the presentation, don't hesitate to reach out and send a message over chat function or to Karen Jaster uh, in jsgs.events at uregina.ca. Just very quickly, the format for today's event is as follows. Following a few opening remarks, our speaker, Dr. Andrew Buzari, will present 30 to 40 minutes. Following that, we'll open it up for a Q&A with the audience. If you'd like to ask a question, please use the chat function to submit your question directly to today's moderator, Dr. Amy Zerzeshny, 
And because we have a large audience in a short amount of time, I'd encourage you to keep your questions concise and to the point so our speaker can respond to as many questions as possible. I know everybody will have lots of questions. Feel free to submit your questions to Dr. Bazar at any time throughout this, this evening's event or this afternoon's event. With that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Lillian Bergall to provide a few welcome remarks. Well, thank you, Andrew. Uh, so I, uh, on behalf of GSGS, I would like to welcome and thank all of you for attending what promises to be an engaging and thought-provoking discussion. I would like to, uh, in particular, acknowledge uh, and welcome uh, Dr. Stan Houston and his son, Adam Houston, uh, to today's event. The Houston Lecture Series would not be possible without the generosity and support of the late Dr. Stewart and Mary Houston and the Houston Family Trust. Both Stewart and Mary were greatly loved at the University of Saskatchewan for their genuine enthusiasm in supporting research and dialogue on campus. Widely known and respected uh, for their love of ornithology, Stewart was also highly regarded for his distinguished medical career, specifically in diagnostic radiology. Interested in both medicine and Saskatchewan history, Stewart published extensively on the history of medicine and Saskatchewan's early achievements in healthcare. An, an early campaigner and defender of Medicare, Stewart developed an insight into the intersection of politics and health, the critical importance of the social determinants of health, and the vital need for public policies impacting health to be based on the best possible evidence. That is why both he and Mary were so keen to support JSGS in facilitating dialogue and creating opportunities for evidence-based research in the areas of health, social justice, and income inequality in Canada. As part of their generous donation, the school launched the annual Houston Lecture Series in 2018 in their honor. Since then, we have welcomed a number of influential speakers to share their insights and are so fortunate to add Dr. Adam Bouzeray to this growing list today. So with that, I'd like to turn the floor over to my colleague, Dr. Amy Zarzechny, uh, to introduce our, well, our keynote speaker. Amy, over to you. Thank you, Lolene. I, it is truly an honor now uh, to introduce our 2023 Houston Lecture Speaker. Dr. Andrew Buzari is a primary care physician and the Executive Director of Population Health and Social Medicine at the University Health Network, or UHN. In this role, Dr. Buzari oversees UHN's social medicine program and works with community partners to improve health outcomes for disadvantaged populations, create a stronger and more equitable health system, and deliver on a memorandum of understanding signed between the City of Toronto, United Way, and UHN. This agreement is the first of its kind in Canada. Dr. Buzari also serves as co-lead of the Ontario uh, Health Toronto Region COVID-19 Homelessness Response and is a member of the Canadian Medical Association's post-pandemic expert advisory group. In addition, Dr. Buzari holds academic appointments as an assistant professor in the Department of Health Policy, Management and Evaluation at the University of Toronto and is an adjunct faculty member at the Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia University. Dr. Buzari completed his medical training in family medicine at the University of Toronto and earned his health policy training at Princeton University with a Master in Public Policy and Harvard University with a Master of Science. He has maintained active research as a visiting scientist at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health since 2014 and is currently a senior fellow at the Wellesley Institute. I think we are in for a very important and an engaging discussion and I'll now turn the floor over to you, Dr. Buzari. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think, uh, thank you, Amy, and thank you for that. I was, I had to appreciate that in terms of um, the, the the remark about being named Adam. I actually took it as a compliment. Andrew Bond and I always get confused for the two Andrews, so I'm really fortunate for the introduction uh, from, from Andrew, and obviously had the chance to meet the um, Houston family, uh, and especially to meet Adam Stan as well, and have been uh, very honored uh, to be chosen uh, and selected for this talk. And I know uh, how uh, influential uh, parents have been and the family has been in this work, both uh, domestically and, and in terms of a global health perspective. Uh, and, and really, I think in terms of the land acknowledgement that uh, Andrew uh, has said so authentically, I think, again, to really, for myself and in terms of starting this talk, to recenter so much of this work and so much that I am grateful for from elders and friends and colleagues uh, in terms of the wisdom and so much of the learning that I've had from my indigenous friends and colleagues uh, with respect to a more holistic 
notion of health. And this has really helped inform the intellectual basis of this talk today with respect to the mirage of universality. This was based, this talk is based on a editorial that uh, and Andreas Lopakis and I published in February of 2020 in the Canadian Medical Association Journal. Uh, and we had no clue about what was going to come with respect to COVID. This was a month before there was a declared state of a global public health emergency. Uh, and really, I hope today to go through a lot of the evidence and the work that we have had with our community partners, uh, much led by Black and Indigenous community le leadership, uh, to try to push towards a more equitable and resilient health system. And so I hope we can capture some of the lessons and learnings uh, going through this evidence, but has both a history uh, as well as a more recent past uh, in terms of what so many in the room have done in terms of the heroism through COVID. So I am, I'm really appreciative for everyone who's been able to show up today. Uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. So in terms of the history, and I think if we've been great, you know, I was, I was mentioning as we had a pre-huddle before the talk, one of my fondest memories uh, was being in Saskatchewan over 10 years ago at health policy conference. I don't even think Ryan Miley was there at that time, but it's good to see Ryan and folks were in place. And uh, at the time, Uwe Reinhardt, who was my graduate uh, supervisor, uh, was in place. And it was one of the most inspiring health conferences with respect to what was happening in Saskatchewan and, and globally. Uh, and if we were together in person, I would ask if anyone knows what city this is. But maybe people are so rapid as they're having lunch to fire in on the chat. And I'll wait a few seconds. But you know, I, again, I, I hope that um, in person, folks, you know, I didn't actually know this looking at it, but apparently the Roman numerals give it away, is that this is a map of Paris. And this is the different R&D smalls that are in place uh, of Paris. And this is actually a map from 1850 or so. And it's one of the first publications that we've had in Western medicine, again, talking about this expansion of our notions of health. At that time, uh, by a young surgeon named Louis-René Velmé. And he was able to document and start to assess this terrible pattern and trend of life expectancy and whether or not someone survived leaving the hospital in that time of Paris was really linked to whether someone was in a low-income small or a high-income neighborhood. Uh, and so the, the real sort of uh, idea in terms of Western medicine of the social determinants of health of this idea of where um, the air someone breathes, uh, what sort of housing or job someone may have, uh, really being the most powerful sort of structural drivers. And uh, the then surgeon saw this as being so powerful, they actually left clinical practice altogether to become quite a preeminent economist and really feeling that income inequality was really the major driver of poor health outcomes and that nothing that could be done in the healthcare space may be able to remedy that. Uh, if we go to the next slide, please. And in terms of the Canadian history and context, uh, again, in terms of some of the more sort of Western publications around uh, the social determinants of health, Canada was actually a leader at the time, this in 1974, now almost 50 years ago. And then um, Minister Mark Lalonde, who fortunately recently passed away, in terms of their legacy, in terms of trying to broaden this understanding of health and the health of all Canadians. And even within 10 years of us passing uh, what would become universal health care access, it was very clear in the Lalonde report that we would need to give as much attention to the social drivers and the social policy questions, as Andrew had mentioned, to the healthcare aspects and healthcare services pieces. And that universal health care alone would not remedy uh, those very serious and wide disparities that were in place, and particularly from a colonial perspective, already uh, indigenous peoples were bearing the brunt of this major divide in terms of healthcare access, and even when there was a push towards universal healthcare. Uh, next slide, please. And so this was a prescient call in 1974. You could argue it kind of put Canada on the map from a sense of the social determinants of health. Uh, it was before the Black Report in the UK or anything coming from the United States, uh, which was in the early 80s. Uh, 
Uh, but so how did we as a country do on the lawn's real push to say that we need to give equal attention? And if federal or public dollars is in some ways a proxy for attention, uh, this was a terrific paper by colleagues in Alberta that were able to show that we did not listen to Mark Lalonde's call at all, that if for a 30-year period, we had seen increases in healthcare spending, uh, but not the same kind of increase in social spending from education to housing. And some may look at this and say, well, this might be a case of whether you know, we're spending too much on health care. And can you shift some of those dollars from health care uh, to social spending? But if we go to the next slide, please. We actually see that internationally, we spend far less from a social spend on both health and social care spending. So that there is quite a strong international case for us to be spending more in terms of the investment needed in health and social outcomes uh, for the Canadian population. And so I think for a long time, we've rested on our laurels of the universal healthcare system and felt that being close to the United States, that we spend uh, a significant amount on public social uh, sector spending. And that is unfortunately not true when you look at how we stack up against other OECD countries. And this was a, a another terrific paper now a few years ago by um, folks in Boston that looked at so much of this data from uh, an international perspective. Uh, next slide, please. And I think the case to really drive, and I think that so much of what we've seen now over the last few years, is that we cannot divorce health equity from performance. And this is some more work and evaluations from the Commonwealth Fund that I mean almost every year pre-pandemic would come out with a very illustrious report from a very powerful think tank and would show uh, how countries stack up against each other, which was a sort of famous policy series of mirror, mirror, uh, and really becoming more and more clear, especially the last few years, that we are closer to the United States than I think anyone would like, uh, especially if we care about performance and how fair our healthcare system is. And so really, I think this point is to, to, to drive home that if we are serious about performance and as Institute of Health Improvement and National Academies of Medicine have really seen health equity as a pillar of performance and patient quality. Uh, we are really suffering on both and are not faring all that well when we actually look at a broader comparator group. Uh, next slide, please. So this leaves us in 2023 with a very stark reality of the fact that a postal code on average remains a better predictor of health outcomes than a genetic code. And we have known for hundreds of years in Western medicine about these powerful social drivers. And I think this is really the call in terms of the work to be done that if, despite all of these important uh, medical advances from cancer to cardiovascular disease, that these structural barriers and structural drivers remain uh, almost impossible to overcome for many populations when we look at the roots of systemic discrimination and structural barriers. Uh, next slide, please. And so I, I want to be very candid about this, because sometimes as we have these debates or this open in public about uh, the kind of universal health system we have, this is a paper that's now almost 10 years old, again, looking and pouring through the data that showed in Ontario, people living in low income neighborhoods had a two and a half fold higher death rate. And I would have to stress avoidable death rate than people in high income neighborhoods. And so when people talk about fairness in terms of what it means in terms of how much tax is to be paid or other elements in terms of what it means from contributions, I would flip that question on its head back to people around, is it fair for children who are born in low-income neighborhoods to have this two and a half to three-fold higher death rate than people who are living in high-income neighborhoods? And that is the reality that was in place in 2014. Uh, and if we can get to the next slide, please. A close colleague of mine, Dr. Siddiqui, here at the University of Toronto has shown that it's actually only worsened and continues to see a worsening disparity when it comes to avoidable mortality in neighborhoods over this period of time. And we will get to uh, the objective around some of the learnings and uh, disparities through COVID uh, that again, this groundwork was already uh, very much in place and was already very much moving in a direction uh, that I would say uh, is damning on us as a country. And we cannot look away from this data. We cannot look away from what the realities were for people coming through the pandemic. Uh, next slide, please. And so when we talk about COVID, uh, 
Uh, again, I think people are starting to see my fascination with maps. I didn't actually do that well in geography, uh, surprisingly enough, in grade school. Uh, but I've come to really love maps uh, throughout uh, this element of trying to best understand the kind of trends and issues that we're seeing. And when you look at income to your far left, this is a map of Toronto. Uh, we see how income is distributed uh, in the city. And again, where we have seen investments and attempts around primary care over the last 20 years. And again, to be uh, completely nonpartisan, that this has spanned over a 10 to 20 year period, the investment in family health teams that we have seen as real sort of the gold standard of care for primary care access was totally uh, disproportionate and mismatched as to where those investments went in terms of uh, where there was actual disease burden and poverty. And I think this is a real indication of the systemic discrimination facing people in poverty, that even when we've had uh, policy choices and policy measures that were ostensibly good, uh, they in many ways widened and deepened some of the access issues that were already in place. And to no one's surprise in the room, I think we've seen this again, unfortunately, across and through each province uh, in Toronto, it was not a uh, did not need an algorithm to tell you where COVID was going to take hold. It was in low-income, racialized communities here in the northwest and northeast of the city of Scarborough and Jane and Finch. Uh, and so much of this compounding now throughout as we look at the real issues and challenges with long COVID and many other sequelae from the last few years. Uh, next slide, please. So what does this mean in terms of the policy choices and how that, again, was active pre-pandemic. Here's the most recent data we have from uh, superb primary care researcher, Rick Glazier and others, that uh, it is almost impossible or it has been a far lower rate for people to have access to a family health team in Scarborough. Uh, and there's been some great journalism and storytelling about what that means. And unfortunately, we saw this play out uh, in life and death throughout the pandemic. And we'll get to some of the solutions and things I think that are important in terms of how we are trying to respond from a delivery, healthcare delivery uh, aspect uh, of, of a response in the next few slides. Um, but next slide, please. This was a call, again, in uh, being incredibly grateful to work with Angela Robertson and Dr. Kwan McKenzie uh, that came out near the beginning of the pandemic in April 14, 2020. And this was a call for collecting health equity data, it really in many ways has been labeled as a race-based data. I would like to remind the room and the audience that at the time of this, the reason when a large impetus for us to write this together was that actually the then chief medical officer of health said, we do not need health equity-based data. We do not need race-based data. We have a universal health system and everyone gets treated equally and everyone has the same access. As you can see from the previous slide, that was not a reality then, is not a reality today when you look at the access to primary care, and is not a reality when it comes uh, to any sort of primary care, to acute care, to long-term care, and home care services. Um, and this is something that, again, community leadership was so pivotal to stand up to these calls, even actually that from public health authorities were saying would not be needed. Uh, and their leadership prevailed through the pandemic. Uh, next slide, please. Their leadership prevailed, but it also, I think, showed the stark realities of why so many of us were concerned about the lack of health equity-based data to inform the uh, government, but also health sector response. Uh, you can see a three to four-fold higher difference in COVID rates uh, for Black, Middle Eastern populations. Uh, indigenous was uh, from reasons of uh, data autonomy and the rightful reasons in terms of the governance to be collected by um, indigenous organizations and leadership. Uh, and we'd also seen the real push here in terms of the disparate impact that different communities were feeling uh, and facing throughout the pandemic. And so that really did fly in the face in a very cruel way to what the then Chief Medical Officer of Health tried to reassure Canadians about when it came to universal access in this mirage that I think we have uh, clung to for far too long. Uh, next slide, please. These are the stark realities, and many of you in the room have done so much. And, uh, I was grateful to work alongside 
Andrew Bond and many others in terms of the homelessness response, but this was the stark reality that was in place. Uh, when we talk about life and death, when people were denied housing as a human right, they were five times more likely to die. And this is from evaluations of Dr. Richards and others uh, in different institutions and a collaborative to try to highlight just how cruel um, the lack of housing and how dire the lack of housing was for people, uh, aside from also being 20 times more likely to be admitted to hospital or be in the ICU, which we know is very prognostic of worse outcomes through COVID in the years to come. Uh, next slide, please. And so this is really the push and the call. And that I hope, and I know many of you have been striving for, that many of you have been writing, researching, or advocating. Uh, this is a call from Don Berwick in the Journal of American Medical Association, JAMA, uh, seen as one of the sort of godfathers of social pediatrics. And this is, I think, we we... I take personally very seriously in my work at UHN and with community partners is that we have talked a lot about the social determinants of health. Many of us have published on the social determinants of health, but how are we going to act and how can we act at a scale to actually finally reverse or improve outcomes um, that we have been accepting, as I hope you can see from the data, uh, for far too long? Uh, next slide, please. So. As Andrew had mentioned, and many others in terms of the introduction, that we are at a very important, and I would say a time of compounding crises. This is what we are seeing right now in Toronto with respect to food bank usage. If this was any other graph, if you looked at this on any other issue, this would be a state of emergency. And this is what it is in Toronto in terms of people having to have, be faced with impossible decisions uh, that are now lining up around food banks, we talk about the pathologies of poverty. And I'm sure in some ways it may be no different, depending on where you are in the country, that almost weekly there is a CEO of a food bank on the radio uh, pleading for a response and actually saying that food banks are not the solution. Uh, and this is the state of use that we're facing right now. And I would deem that this is a state of emergency when it comes to the pathologies of poverty that people are having to deal with. Uh, next slide, please. And what does this mean in terms of a healthcare perspective? This was a, a phenomenal paper now, again, almost 10 years ago, a seminal paper by colleagues in California. They're able to show that as people had an exhaustion of their food budgets or food vouchers in the system in the US, that they were uh, far more likely to show up to the emergency department with hypoglycemia and far worse health outcomes. And so again, we're seeing any uh, tears in the social safety net pouring into healthcare systems uh, whether it's in the U.S. and now the case that I will be continuing to be making uh, as powerfully in Canada. Uh, next slide, please. So what would you have us do as health workers or as a health network? This was uh, some of the work that we partnered with Food Chair Toronto and the Aero Foundation and others, uh, knowing and anticipating that this was only going to get worse in terms of people being able to access food security. Uh, we were able to uh, deliver good food boxes every few weeks, as well as checking in from a loneliness perspective, knowing its impact on mental health and public health. Uh, and we were able, over the two-year period, to have more than 200 families and patients uh, enrolled in the program. Uh, and we've had some evaluations coming out that were, again, unsurprisingly clear on its impact on mental health, patient report outcomes, and actually healthcare utilization. And there's been a lot of work from Dr. Tarashik and many others across the country showing just how linked food insecurity and health outcomes is. And we're fortunate for that great research. Uh, but at the hospital level, I think it is very difficult for those of us in clinics or in different healthcare settings to continue to watch uh, these cycles on repeat. And this is one example in terms of how we've had to move from a food prescribing notion that I would have never imagined ha having to do uh, in medical school or during my medical training. Uh, next slide, please. This is one of the individuals who uh, be has benefited from the program. And again, I think just yesterday, again, in advance of this talk of looking at, fortunately, you know, it's it's a terrible doom loop uh, to look at the news today and, and all of the injustice that is happening in the world. Um, but in looking at it, actually, this was from last summer, uh, more surveys and reports that more people because of inflation uh, and corporate greed, corporate aspects 
are continuing to be faced without being able to afford nutritious food. Uh, and so unfortunately, this program uh, had to run its course over two years as a pilot. And we are now sort of faced with an even worse reality for many of our UHN patients. And I know for many of you in the room, um, regardless of where you are in the country. Uh, next slide, please. So people have been for a long time forced into these impossible decisions. This is uh, great work and research from Dr. Mike Law. When you look at, again, the limitations of our Medicare system uh, that has excluded access to publicly available drugs. And when you look at over 10% of households at that time, and there is much uh, concern from uh, colleagues in health services research, that number is now far higher of people who are living in low household incomes, not being able to afford uh, their medications. And we're seeing this impossible decision between food, medication, and rent, uh, which we will get to in terms of this compounding uh, crisis that continues to play out even worse than in certain periods of the last few years. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this was, again, some work that uh, colleagues and I were able to look at the impact uh, led by uh, Dr. Nath Prasad, looking at you know what would happen if you were able to provide <laughs> patients uh, medications for free. And unsurprisingly, uh, people we're more likely to take them and people's health outcomes improved. Uh, and again, I would say, again, being fortunate and grateful to work with so many superb researchers uh, on this paper and many others that have come out of this work. I think it's also a testament to how terrible things are in our country that we need a randomized control trial to be able to make the case to policymakers that if people could actually afford their medications, they'd be more likely to take them. Uh, so that's one of, I hope, the messages that continues uh, to resonate as we are seeing many in the room pushing, many in Saskatchewan, historically, many across various provinces, pushing for pharmacare as a Medicare expansion that is so needed. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is some, again, other work in terms of policy choices and these opportunity costs uh, that is very clear and that we'll get to sort of later and really looking forward in terms of the discussion as to the way that we have tried to approach health sector reform and ways to try to, in certain cases, reduce pressures in the emergency department was the idea of uh, pay for performance. Uh, one thing is I'm now, you know, years out from um, learning and, and being and continue to learn from Uwe Reinhardt, but as a uh, years out as a grad student and now as faculty, uh, it is somewhat um, devilish that we always kind of resort to a three letter acronym to save us in healthcare, whether it's HMOs, ACOs, P4P, OHTs. Uh, and uh, I would say, given that stretch of, uh, in, of outcomes, uh, they were modest at best. Uh, I think we need to really be thinking differently of how we would look at these opportunity costs and where we spend our dollars. And if you look at the $100 million that went into P4P that our evaluation showed did not have much of an effect at all, wait times, that kind of uh, investment could have had a real impact for people's housing status, especially for those folks who are more likely to end up in the emergency department. Uh, and I hope that again, in these calls and in these talks, that we can see a real push for policymakers uh, to be engaging and responding differently. Uh, but these are opportunity costs that we now have to carry. Uh, next slide, please. So some of the learnings through the pandemic, uh, again, being able to work uh, with inner city health associates, the city of Toronto, uh, UHN early on in Parkdale, Queen West and the neighborhood group. There was a real push around COVID recovery hotels. It became very clear for people who are unhoused that one of the most important elements of the response was peer workers, people with lived experience who were able uh, to provide that kind of support that have lived and shared experience from a trauma-informed approach uh, and could help people, especially for those who may use drugs, those who are without housing, uh, those who are mental health crisis. And we were able to work with our emergency department colleagues at UHN and the neighborhood group to now have peer workers in the emergency department since the end of 2020. And today now close to 2000 patients have been seen. And this real work uh, to try to integrate health and social care was that start of rapid learnings through the pandemic. And this is Mia, who was one of uh, the first peer workers in the emergency department. 
has actually gone on to be working in the city of Toronto's mental health crisis response uh, and seeing so much incredible work from peer workers that continue to inform the system, not only from the lived experience, but from the way that they are pushing for us to innovate in how we are delivering care. Uh, next slide, please. And that innovation, uh, that those learnings, what we heard directly from people in the emergency department, from people who are more likely uh, to end up due to alcohol intoxication or substance use, uh, is what led us to develop the Stabilization Connection Center with the same partners uh, with Toronto Paramedic Services uh, that was able to see now close to 2,000 admissions over the last nine months, uh, where people who would usually uh, be intoxicated with alcohol, um, you know, it happens to many of us in the room uh, that there are nights where you may drink too much. What I hope happens is that a friend may order you an Uber or taxi home or get you home and then potentially uh, chide you in the morning for what you did. Um, but that seems to be the only cost. But for people who are unhoused, the only calls that are made are to the police or 911 uh, or for the ambulance. And what happens is this is a terrible and traumatic experience for people uh, who do use drugs or use substances. Uh, and this was a preferential option that we try to create with our Indigenous health program and various partners to ensure that this is a more uh, respectful space in terms of the kind of care and connection that's needed. Uh, and it's fully staffed by peer workers and harm reduction workers uh, and with inner city health associates providing some of the on-call from a primary care perspective as well. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is also informed again from so much of the evidence that this work is, is so helpful to try to create a more inclusive, environment for people in the emergency department or in the stabilization and connection center. But when you look at so much of the experiences that are needed, both globally uh, and domestically, we have seen the, the incredible value of community health workers who are able to bridge so much of this, where for us at the Gattuso Center, we have been at the intersection of hospital and community, and CHWs have been the real staple, a real staple of health and social care. And this is a photo of Tracy from our team has been our lead CHW and the work that's been done now over a number of years, uh, helping uh, patients in the liver clinic, but more of this work in terms of the connection from income promotion to housing supports that are needed as people either leave the Stabilization and Connection Center or for those folks who are marginalized and not being able to access things like basic primary care and end up having these terrible uh, doom loops of um, acute care utilization that we know both has an impact on the health system, but most importantly, does not fare well or bode well for people's health outcomes and their own human dignity in the experience. Uh, next slide, please. So some of the evidence, again, about just how powerful the impact of CHWs can actually be in the North American context. This was some work of an RCT a few years ago showing that CHWs can have a real impact in terms of uh, the health care utilization benefits in an ACO structure. Uh, as many organizations in uh, Ontario are moving to Ontario health teams, again, that we have seen a, a, a very lackluster link between hospital and community-based care. And I think CHWs and peer workers are the real uh, additions and valued members and should be of uh, thinking about health teams in the future uh, beyond the amazing work of uh, physicians, nurses, social workers, pharmacists, and all the teams that have been in place, that we have to be thinking differently about the kind of teams that we are creating based on our learnings, both through the pandemic uh, and before. Uh, next slide, please. So what does this mean in terms of disconnecting, in terms of hospital readmissions, hospital beds? One of the slides, you know, again, knowing that to, to want to protect time is that it is maybe not surprising now for people to realize in Ontario, we have some of the least or fewest acute uh, hospital beds per capita in the OECD. And then we're also working in a system where there is the least amount of access to uh, shelter beds. So the argument is that we can no longer disconnect the housing crisis from the hospital bed crisis that unfortunately now comes up on repeat almost every winter, regardless of which jurisdiction you're in in Canada. And this is one of the more recent um, uh, articles on just how dire the situation is. This was about 273 calls a day that were going in June. Actually, in July and August, this was over 300 with some of the more recent data from the city itself in terms of calls going unanswered for people to locate a bed uh, and how all of this compounds in the system and drives all of 
the issues in us not being able to deliver housing and refusing to deliver housing as a human right. Uh, next slide, please. We would be remiss and it would be a real, it would be egregious to not again name the systemic discrimination that is driving uh, homelessness, that it is black, indigenous and refugee newcomer populations that make up close to 60% of uh, the uh, people who are surviving homelessness uh, in Toronto. We have seen, again, unfortunately, these same trends in various cities in the US, but also various parts of Canada and in Europe. Uh, and really, I would ask the audience, you know, would we accept these kind of outcomes for any other population? Uh, we did it during COVID. We've seen rapid mobilization of pieces around housing or short-term interim options. But chronically, this is the violence of systemic discrimination in terms of which populations continue uh, to have to try to survive without housing. Uh, next slide, please. And this failure on human dignity and on housing is very expensive. And we see that people live half as long from some of the data around what researchers have pulled together. And again, another randomized trial. I think you can see the trend here that I'm trying to make that we have RCT after RCT showing of the, the benefits. We'd have to do a randomized trial to show that housing would be beneficial for people's health. We saw a positive effect. This is now over 10 years ago, now close to 10 years ago, excuse me. And we've not seen the kind of political action and choices that we needed to see this happen. Uh, next slide, please. Here's some of the cost structure. We could see just if you are you know, some will accuse Andrew Bond and I of being uh, bleeding heart primary care physicians. Even if you are a uh, cold hearted economist, though my economist friends are not cold hearted, they're some of the most uh, generous people I know. Uh, but if you are in a camp of where it's all about fiscal prudence, uh, this is even more damning as to how these decisions are being made. And again, it being almost impossible not to see the root of uh, structural racism and systemic discrimination that we'd be willing to pay more to keep people in the provincial jail system, there's almost a de facto mental health system, more in an interim shelter system at 7,500 uh, versus what it is for supportive housing for people to have both housing, but also the kind of supports that are needed in place. Um, next slide, please. This is some of the work that we've been again doing in terms of this population health approach, this social medicine integration piece of rapidly learning through what has taken place. And here is the most recent uh, development around building uh, 51 housing units with the City of Toronto United Way with investment from every level of government uh, to shift our view of it's not about just healthcare, but health. We need to embrace a need to move upstream in addressing this housing crisis. And the hope is that we can see uh, patients and people uh, be able to move in Near the end of this year, and it is to be run by a community operator. Uh, I would never want a hospital to be a landlord. I would never want them to be my landlord. Uh, and this is really, again, in, in the spirit of collaboration with community of not to have hospital overreach, but to be thinking about how we can partner more than prescribe housing and this kind of upstream approach that is so pivotal. Uh, next slide, please. Here's the rendering, and I'll fly through of what it's supposed to look like. You saw the real shot. Um, you know, I actually think, you know, there's always a like reality versus Instagram. I actually found the real thing looks better, um, on this, and I'm not an architect, but you know, the only piece on this, I've been so happy that we're building a community kitchen. There's a community garden in the back. Uh, and I'm still in active disputes around the color of the blinds from yellow, but it's probably the fight I am going to lose. Um, but this is again, really what I am so encouraged by is that we interviewed which it seems so basic and so rudimentary, but we interviewed people with lived experience around with, of, of homelessness about what they wanted to see in their housing. And again, in a health system, as a health system, we have been not doing that nearly enough. And one of the things that I think, again, moved so many folks on our team was that people felt that they needed to have their pet with them. And that was a huge barrier for them being in the shelter system. And that's something that, again, around building this inclusive housing. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, homelessness is a policy choice. This is a very quick uh, graph around where we were on the number of social housing units back in the 70s, 74. You could see again, or even around the time of Lalonde, 
they voiced their team concern about what housing would look like in terms of affordability. And we are now less than 3% with respect to social housing options for people. It is so bad that uh, Scotiabank, which is not exactly a left-wing think tank, has come out and said, we need to double the amount of social housing options for people. And even if we double the amount of uh, social housing options, as you can see the trend, we would only be at the average of OECD countries. We are on this issue as well, near the bottom, if not at the bottom. Uh, next slide, please. And again, I think making the case around the social policy pieces, some really important work coming from France around the importance of income and homelessness. If we go to the next slide, please. A more recent powerful example, I think this made headlines almost everywhere near the end of the summer uh, of work from researchers in Vancouver to show that if people were actually able to receive a lump sum of cash of $7,500, it was not just uh, quote unquote blown away, they were actually able to see more sustainable housing options and improvements in their own well-being, uh, mental health. And again, I think the, the core of this is that we cannot deny people the human dignity. Um, but this was a RCT, again, that was published um, in a journal just a few months ago. Uh, next slide, please. And I think to summarize and close, I think to capture, I think, a lot of this discussion that is, again, a incredibly challenging time to be talking about this because I think if people are in healthcare or you're in social care, uh, you've been seeing this for so long and the solutions in some ways are so obvious. Um, but I hope that this discussion in trying to reframe some of this work around um, exposing this mirage of universality and some of the evidence-informed solutions that we are trying to mobilize here at UHN on a more local scale uh, can be seen scaled at a more uh, national level, uh, knowing that so many of you are actively engaged in that work. Uh, but again, my my thanks, and I'll go to the last slide that was uh, the last line uh, by Mark uh, Lalonde uh, in memory uh, of the report. And I think it is as um, poignant today as it was 50 years ago, uh, that this is going to be about choices. The evidence is clear. And these elements, these, these policy choices have been imposed on people. And uh, we really need to see uh, this shift in the way that we are framing and thinking about these wicked health uh, and social policy problems. So my gratitude again for this invitation and really looking forward uh, to whatever discussion we can have and any follow-up on this work. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. That was a really powerful presentation and you've covered so many uh, really, I think, important issues for our discussion today. Um, I already have questions coming in through the chat, but just again, a reminder to our audience members, if you do have a question, please submit it to me directly. It's Amy Zarzechny via the chat messaging, and I'll be happy to pose it on your behalf. And they, they are flooding in. So I think we have a lot of excitement in the room. Um, I'll start with, a, there's a, a few questions have come in, I think, um, and I'll blend them together because they engage in similar themes around um, sort of focusing on the importance of evidence to ideally inform or influence policy. And wondering if you can speak to your knowledge of the extent to which we have data that shows uh, social spending in a proactive policy sense goes further than health spending in a more reactive or downstream sense. Yeah, thanks, Amy. I mean, I, I hope I understand the question correctly. I think it's you know really important when you've got people in the room um, like Ryan Miley, you could probably speak to it powerfully of going from practice to what it's like uh, in politics and what's actually going to move uh, politicians and policymakers. Uh, I have spent quite a significant amount of my career uh, advising governments from the city to provincial and federal level, uh, though never actively um, in, in elected office or in any sort of uh, decision making capacity. But I do think that um, there is potentially some. Uh, power in being able to frame, as I think you mentioned, Amy, this sort of return on investment that's more proactive. I think, again, it goes back to the old adage that, you know, one um, ounce of uh, prevention is more than a pound of cure in terms of being worth more. And I think it is a challenge, I think now, especially for many scientists, researchers, academics, you know, coming through the pandemic, we saw so much of this coming in terms of the tensions around science tables and decision making and something so acute like a global pandemic uh, and how decisions were being made. Uh, again, more and more factors that come in that are beyond uh, 
uh, some of the, the grips of RCT results. And I think, unfortunately, what we see is something that's not surprising for people, active lobbying uh, for interests that sometimes, and, and in many instances, run counter current to the kind of return on investment or, or benefits of social spending that you put in place. One that I can't you know, think of in some ways even more powerfully than what's happened to our elders and seniors uh, with respect to long-term care homes. I, I remember leaving a long-term care home where I volunteered to see 82 people die in a matter of days. And I left thinking, we're never going to go back. Policymakers, the public has seen this. We heard stories of our grandparents and parents um, dying in the sort of facilities that we had built, uh, that they were run mainly for profit. We'd seen a protective effect in uh, publicly run uh, long-term care homes. And even on something like that, even on something that I would say is one of the most harrowing things that I've seen throughout the pandemic, it is nowhere near part of the political discourse in, in debate around where we need to move in terms of the health system around long-term care or home care. So uh, it's not to be a, a buzzkill on this. I think the evidence and the work that is happening is so important, but I do think this, this sort of mobilization to counter uh, so much of the active efforts around lobby groups and interest groups is going to be important uh, and pivotal for us to see some traction on these issues, whether it's about long-term care to primary care uh, to housing as a human right. And I think sometimes those of us who are in the university setting and periods of my career felt, you know, if you publish, you put out the evidence in a high-impact journal, that high-impact means that, you know, policymakers may take that seriously. And they, and they may, those who, you know, can kind of decipher some of these findings or they could be so obvious, Amy, as you're mentioning, to be beneficial, uh, there's so many various moving pieces that I think, unfortunately, uh, really crowd out the important findings that so many of you put forward. Thank you very much for that response. Uh, we also have some interest in the concept of social medicine and um, wondering if you could speak a bit about the history of sort of that framing and, you know, whether to what extent you think it's, in, it's an important way of thinking about what we're trying to accomplish when we're looking at reaching for solutions for so many of these challenges you've identified that are facing our healthcare systems. And that, again, as you've noted, many in the room can speak to very directly in, in terms of those lived experiences. Yeah, I appreciate it. And I, I always promise that, especially given that I have so much, you know, respect for people in the room, um, in the policy space to always, you know, be as candid as I can. I mean, I think the um, debate about social medicine or, you know, the term and the phrasing, I mean, in, in some respect, it's really a state of desperation. I mean, and nothing about some of these elements are new. And I always, out of humility, you know, do raise the Lawand report. These notions of us having to deal with social issues, social policy issues, have been here from the beginning of us trying to deliver a healthcare system. Uh, you go back even further. Hastings report about community health centers. You look at what CHCs do across the country. They've been doing social medicine uh, for decades. Uh, and again, you look at these other, you know, sort of holistic approaches to health and well-being from various communities, that has been in place you know, for a very long time. And I think part of the elements around, you know, how do you not only shift policymakers, but a discipline that has not seen these social drivers as in their lane. Uh, you can see many folks saying it's already hard enough for us to provide decent health care versus to have to be thinking about issues around housing to poverty. And so part of this push around social medicine, I think is really about rooting it within the clinical discipline of there needs to be one, more than social prescribing. I do have some contention at times with it. The P word for me is about partnership. How do you ensure that we are actually building and integrating a system? And so not to be asking surgeons to be writing scripts for housing and become housing experts, but then how are you actually building the teams and workforces with CHWs, with peer workers, with partnerships, with different uh, levels of government to actually ensure that that can happen in a way that, you know, benefits first and foremost, the patient and community, but also the health workforce that not only, you know, was we're seeing bandwidth issues and capacity issues, real moral distress around people feeling that if you're working in an emergency department, or if you're working in a hospital ward, or primary care setting, this revolving door this doom loop that I've mentioned 
uh, continues to weigh on people, especially after health workers have seen atrocious things that were predominantly social failures play out again and again and not see action. So I think there's an element of, you know, strategic framing, but I would never want it to be perceived, you know, in terms of it being in any way new as the, the foundation of social medicine is a couple hundred years old to its practice, you know, being in place now for many decades. Um, but how do you shift institutions to think differently? I think some of it um, is how we can frame and partner differently than we have in the past. Thank you for that. Uh, you spoke, I think, quite persuasively about the power of some of the community partnerships and the initiatives that you've been involved with. And we have a question um, wondering about uh, making some links to the pioneers in this work that we're seeing with some of the cooperative health clinics uh, here in Saskatchewan, Saskatoon specifically, that have member governance structures. Um, and wondering about your thoughts around where that allocation of decision-making power, sort of governance more broadly, fits within your recommendations in this area or within your view of kind of the power of those uh, yeah. different models. Yeah, thanks, Amy. And I just hope for the record, you know, I came right at 40 minutes on the talk, which is what was allotted. And so I, I really, over the last few weeks, you know, poured through every slide to figure out what we can and can't in terms of be able to put in place, but one slide that I think is so important that was not able to put in place, I felt was a, a barrage of evidence and papers as well, is that uh, there was a recent paper from colleagues in CMAJ that showed the lack of representation of racialized women in decision-making roles uh, across the country. That is at less than 0.2%, whether it's deputy ministers or hospital CEOs. So I think that is an issue that has to be addressed from a representation and shared decision-making element and sort of uh, that that element in terms of what can happen. And, and I feel that much more passionate about it in the sense of the work that we saw happen through COVID. And I will, again, in full authenticity, speak to one of our failures at the hospital was that initially in the pandemic, we had the view, hospital colleagues and folks, you know, had the view that if you build it, people will come in terms of vaccine clinics. And we'd set up some very large, very you know beautiful looking uh, vaccine clinics that were very inviting when you're there, like there was almost like elevator music and people in place. It was like a very, you know, to not disparage my colleagues, it was an amazing effort to set that up in a matter of days or weeks uh, on site. But we learned really quickly that this was not going to be the case. Those who could come were those who could afford to come. And we needed to actually shift the way we delivered care. This is really about a delivery innovation. And community leadership actually led that. And I was fortunate to work very closely and alongside community leadership of where there was so much resistance to liberating the vaccine. There's these views of that we would put them through pharmacies or through hospitals that there was also this other root of systemic racism where I'd heard in, in where we were advocating in various meetings, well, racialized populations don't want the vaccine. So we'll continue to keep them, you know, in Rosedale, if people want them, they can still make it out. It's free. Well, you know, I give kudos to colleagues and friends like Cheryl Prescott and Angela Robertson said, well, you know what, if you give us the vaccine, we can deliver it in a place like Jane and Finch, which had one of the highest rates of COVID and the least amount of access to vaccines, uh, they, we were able to have over 3,000 people vaccinated within the first 48 hours on a public basketball court. It's one thing I will never forget of the pandemic. And that shows about the shift to say, you actually have to work together. And there's so much community can teach about healthcare innovation. So I think the question is actually a very important comment and that we in medical sciences have constantly believed that innovation only flows one way. It goes from the hospital out in sciences into community, but we actually have so much innovation to learn on the delivery of communities into the way that we deliver healthcare, into the way that we deliver uh, science and therapeutics in the hospital or various clinical settings. And so I hope that's something that um, can be reiterated from that really important comment about how crucial that was. And that saved lives in the northwest of the city, Scarborough and various places that uh, I showed you on these maps. That's great, thank you. 
Um, we have another question that, a couple of questions, but um, focusing on sort of the role of private or investor owned private delivery in terms of increasing access and some of the debates that are taking place among varied communities, physician groups, public governments, and others. Um, and sort of, again, some, I think, legitimate debate around what will this mean in terms of access, implications for universality, for the health of Medicare on a long-term basis. Um, do you have any insights or thoughts you'd like to share on that question? You really, yeah, making sure I just, you know, go go full out uh, in this conversation. Appreciate it, Amy. Um, I think, I hope, which was clear, and if I can reiterate in the discussion, is that we have fail to innovate in the public system. And there have been many innovations in the public system over many years that have dropped off as either pilots. Uh, again, we recently lost Minister Beijing, who was famously said Canada is a country of perpetual pilot projects when it came to healthcare. And I think we have falsely uh, debated this issue of where innovation can only come from profitization. And we saw this in the pandemic when it came to certain for-profit groups saying, we will do this work uh, in terms of, uh, you know, delivering vaccines or tests. And I hope that it was clear that actually the most effective way of this happening was us innovating and changing and shifting the way that we delivered services. And there's a great example, of course, in Saskatchewan, the private MRI experiment, I don't think has been a, um, standalone success, I think, you know, it can also be in debate, but there was no debate about some of the public innovations in Saskatchewan with centralized wait lists, reducing wait times for hip and knee surgeries. Those pilots in Saskatchewan and Alberta have come to an end. So I think we need to see these innovations in the public system. I think believing that there's some magic around for-profit, the privatization being able to deliver innovation alone uh, does not align with the evidence. And I've seen the comment in the chat, you know, and, and so much of this too, about looking at the global domestic piece around community health workers, uh, you know, to not um, too emotional, you know, we lost Paul Farmer a few years ago, just last year, who was a close uh, mentor um, and colleague. You know, I think the big piece is that he always pushed with me and in my work with him globally was, we can't compromise for people in poverty and to say, you know, we can accept different things and different outcomes. And I think if we in the health system do compromise their, their interests, we lose trust and, and trust can evaporate very fast and it takes years to build. And I think us edging and inching towards or shifting towards the belief that a for-profit model is going to actually benefit those people that we serve, I actually think that's an abdication of trust. And if someone has the preponderance of evidence to show that for-profit models have delivered, especially for low-income communities, I'd be happy to receive it and, you know, happy to, to continue the debate. But I think from my, you know, close read of the health policy evidence, I have not seen something um, that compelling uh, for that direction. Thank you very much. Now you may have seen uh, Dr. Houston's question in the chat, but he shares your um, interest in the history of, of French surgeons work and enjoyed that piece of the presentation, but uh, is, is posing a question to you about sort of the, the pushback that we're seeing and this what your experiences might suggest are the sources of it. So um, after all of the sort of many years of obvious evidence that we have, uh, wondering what the sources um, of resistance to the recognition of that critical importance of the social determinants of health are among the general public, political leaders, but also among members of the medical profession. Yeah, it sounds like, and you know, I look forward to, to reading the chat. I apologize, I can't open it on that. It seems like there's, you know, very rich comments and questions. Um, you know, and trying to maybe most directly and best decipher the, the question uh, from Dr. Houston, I think, I mean, I, I think there's just so many um, elements that are coming into play very, very quickly. And I think, and that have been in place actually for a very long time. I think in terms of recognizing the social determinants of health, I think this continues to be an area where we actually have seen, I, I hope, some broader recognition. Again, I mentioned folks like Paul and Angela and Cheryl and others who are doing great work to, 
I really believe enlighten those of us in medical spaces uh, about that connection. Uh, but I also do think part of this is going to have to come down to their being alignment of incentives of the way of systems are working. You know, we've seen this around something like primary care, which I think all of us in the room would hope is ostensibly good. It's a good, you know, to, and it's a foundation to a high performing health system. The fact that we have 7 million people who can't access primary care, how can you say we have a universal health care system? And so you can understand then that there's frustration from people who can't access a primary care doc who will say, well, if it means we have to go private, we'll do so. There's some speculation you know, some folks are in policymaking roles, waiting, deciding to see, you know, is this going to be the kind of shift as people hit this breaking point and not being able to see a primary care doctor or not be able to be seen for their cancer care? I mean, these are very, very real and pressing issues facing people right now as to where uh, I'm sitting and where all of you are sitting. And I think that what we have to see come into play is a real um, response from policymakers. Otherwise, I, I just... I think that this is in some ways the the most danger I've seen Medicare be in in a long time coming through the pandemic. And I think, you know, what can be done, the policy incentives have to be in place. If you look at, as mentioning the family health teams, if you don't ensure there's risk adjustment to go into low income, high needs areas, then we've actually only furthered this divide and actually further people suffering um, who are already without options in the first place. So I think we can't, and this is where the expertise in the room is so important, you know, from behavioral science to delivery science to the policy foundations of what unintended consequences there are as to how healthcare is delivered. We are so behind in Canada on delivery innovation. You know, we the fact that someone in the room, uh, any of the physicians or nurses or health workers could be frozen cryogenically and come back uh, at a time in the in the 70s and still be able to kind of move around and still see a fax machine and still figure that that, that they knew what that was um, and be able to use it. We have not moved uh, nearly fast enough on delivery innovation. And we're now talking about you know, recognizing you have to get care out to where people are at. That's something we, we've known about for 20 or 30 years, if not more, to the points that in the room and in the chat. So you know, what it's going to take politically, I think it's going to take a lot of mobilization and organization. And I don't want to get, uh, you know, too much into certain politics and partisanship, but I think is a nonpartisan comment. We've seen things where the public has cared enough and there is good journalism. Certain policy decisions can be reversed that were looked to benefit uh, certain for-profit holding companies versus the public interest. Uh, and my hope is that we can do the same on something even um, this monumental like M Medicare. Thank you. Uh, so much, so much there we could follow up on. And I, I think a number of, of people in the room are very interested in hearing um, a few more of your thoughts around that primary care access challenge. So some of the questions are framed around difficulty accessing family physicians, others are looking at, at primary care more broadly, but wondering if you could share your thoughts um, on what needs to be prioritized in terms of our policy response to addressing that the current challenge that we're seeing really across the country when it comes to primary care. And if you have any thoughts or distinctions about what perhaps it might be prioritized in the short term versus the long term. Thanks. These are such easy questions. So I appreciate that. I mean, I've never I, given you a smooth ride. I wouldn't have expected anything less from this room of policy wonks. But I think, um, you know, the, the, the piece that I would say is we should not accept anything less than universal access to primary care. If that needs to be, to me, the standard measurement um, if we're moving forward. I think we have in some ways been complacent in creeping up even in this province in the high 80s or low 90s. Uh, and again, you've seen the data that I've shown in terms of where there's a total mismatch of those resources and investments. Uh, I think, and this may be, and this is I hope the point of this to have debate in the place and there may be folks who disagree. Uh, I think we need to be building new healthcare teams to respond to the primary care crisis. I think we need to be working alongside and partnering with nurse practitioners. Uh, this cannot be the old models of care. We need to be really ensuring that we are um, enabling NPs to their scope of practice, to be working with teams. We need to be um, immobilizing CHWs as part of the primary care team in terms of being able to address many of the unmet social needs that we know have 
very real uh, health implications. Uh, and I think we need to be very deliberate in the spending and the accountabilities that come forward with respect to uh, building and paying staff and investing in the health workforce to be able to care for everyone. And I think part of this is going to be, you know, we haven't paid nurses fairly for a very long time. We haven't paid certain healthcare workers fairly for a very long time. I think those things need to come into place to prevent so much of um, the, the burnout and atrophy that we're seeing in the system. Uh, and I think really building these new teams from scaling CHC models that have had great success to family health teams, a myriad of options that has to be really tailored locally. I can't say from sitting in downtown academic hospital in Toronto, what's going to work in a certain smaller part of uh, the province or smaller town in the province. But that's what's going to be required is, you know, people there know what the solutions are. There needs to be a real investment for us to get to universal access to primary care. And I think the short term solution is just the same. You know, the long term solution is it's going to be about new healthcare teams and I think policy incentives to say you can't use and push adverse selection anymore. You know, I think if we don't risk adjust in these payments to say we're actually going to prioritize high needs, patients, low income, racialized communities, then we are not going to get to universal access for primary care. And so I think that now needs to be very deliberate because the fact that it was admitted 10 or 20 years ago has been one of the major drivers of primary care access disparities. Thank you for that. And I, I know not, a, not an easy answer we're asking you to tackle here, but I think, think everyone appreciates your thoughts. Um, we have another question identifying some potential echoes between the work of partners in health and the community health workers approach of uh, UHN. And wondering if you'd like to speak about how your work with partners in health uh, may have influenced your approach to social medicine. I will also say, I'd, I'm not sure everyone will necessarily be familiar with partners in health. So I wonder if, if in answering that, you might give everyone a bit of a background on that particular initiative. Yeah. Thanks, Ryan. And, you know, I'm hopeful we get to reconnect on some of the, the work around PIH and Partners in Health um, is an organization that uh, started 30, 40 years ago. And folks, some folks who were in medical school. I mentioned Paul Farmer. Uh, there were some other founding members at the time around really trying to push these preferential options to healthcare access, um, starting in Haiti and many different countries. Uh, through different ways of having community-led responses to the sort of healthcare needs that were in place. Uh, and there's been, you know, um, amazing and well-documented work. There's a documentary around PIH's work that was just out a few years ago, if folks are interested. Um, yeah, I mean, I get a little choked up on this one because it's obviously very close to my heart in terms of the work with Paul and many colleagues and mentors that I've worked with at PIH over the years. And I think uh, you know, as the question, as a comment, absolutely, it's been powerful uh, from my time in Rwanda to my time in various parts of the country of, of working alongside CHWs. Um, I've always uh, came back and was working, you know, through the pandemic, wondering why, you know, we hadn't really scaled and supported um, CHWs. But again, I think there's also many of the elements around why we haven't done the same around personal support workers. You know, many of the times, you're uh, dealing um, and um, the, the, the aspect of racialized women in these spaces. And I think, again, it goes to, would we accept those kind of standards or pay or um, the kind of uh, valid validation uh, in any other part of the health system? And so I think we really have to reckon with that and be able to ensure that we are paying CHWs, recognizing CHWs in this as, a, as with their real health expertise, uh, the same as we need to around personal support workers and peer workers. Uh, and again, I think, as I showed, the evidence is clear in a place as corporate as uh, as Philadelphia with the accountable care organization to the amazing impacts that are happening in Rwanda, Mexico, and elsewhere with CHW. So I, I'm really hopefully, you know, uh, one of the biggest proponents for CHWs becoming a real staple of healthcare delivery. And I know CHCs have been doing this for a long time. And I hope it's time that more hospitals and various acute care hospitals recognize their amazing impact, both in Canada um, and internationally. Thank you. 
And I think your your work uh, with community partners has really resonated and uh, triggered a lot of interest as well among our audience members today. So um, again, to sort of bring a few people's areas of interest together, I wonder if you could speak a bit about your vision for sort of the role that that community-based knowledge can play in strengthening our healthcare systems, especially from an equity perspective. Um, and if there's any sort of particular aspects of that when it comes to working with Indigenous communities that you might be able to expand upon based on your experience. Right. On first, you know, with respect to indigenous communities, as the question was raised, I think we have to be very clear that we have not at all delivered in healthcare on the recommendations of TRC. We have a abysmal record on that in terms of what we have done around truth and reconciliation in healthcare. And so I think that on matters of health equity is has to be a priority and continue to be the priority when it comes to um, advancing health equity in the Canadian health system. I think we could go through, unfortunately, lecture after lecture that have been led by many um, Indigenous scholars and leaders around the disparities and cruelty that faces uh, Indigenous people in Canada. And I think the epidemiology and uh, scientific work that's been done to show everything from the differences just recently, a report around life expectancy. Uh, it is damning. It is the most damning record that we have on um, Indigenous health in terms of where we are in health equity. Uh, and I think, you know, I'm not the one to speak to it. But I think it's important that uh, my view and my learning of this is it has to be Indigenous-led Indigenous leadership has to be clear about what and how we we respond to these um, major uh, cruelties in, in partnership. Uh, and that's something that, again, even when we were looking at the Stabilization Connection Center, the importance of the Indigenous health program being clear, knowing that uh, given the roots of structural racism and anti-Indigenous racism, that uh, more people, uh, that there is a higher comorbidity of substance use uh, that is in place and worse outcomes in accessing uh, the kind of treatments and supports that are needed. So when it when it comes to this work, it has to be in partnership and actually indigenous led on indigenous issues. Uh, and that's something that, um, you know, I'm, I'm really firm about and I've been uh, able to learn through uh, leaders like Mike Anderson and others that I've been able to work with really closely. Uh, and I think on issues around community uh, leadership, in terms of, I think, the question around, you know, how do we ensure this happens? Well, I think it also happens is that we need to ensure that people from racialized backgrounds can actually be in leadership positions and can actually be uh, placed and um, listened to in the way that we actually see our governance, in the way that we actually look at the way that we respond. I mean, when we talked about health equity data collection, there's a real reason also that racialized populations may not want health equity data collection. That's because we have abused racialized communities' trust, especially Black and Indigenous communities, on how we have used this data and information and that importance around the autonomy and self-determination of how that data is being used, I think has to be really clear in any sort of efforts that we have around data collection uh, to the delivery response. Um, and so I think we've seen amazing examples of various uh, parts of the country. You know, Manitoba, you look at Dr. Marsha Anderson's work to lead uh, Indigenous health equity data collection. Um, they are far ahead. Uh, there are other examples across the country. Uh, and so I, I think really it goes back to this. And I know when you're a physician and you can straddle in policy, people love the term prescription. Uh, but I, I really do hope when we talk about partnership, it's not lip service. And especially uh, with communities that have been um, so shut out of the advances that we've had in healthcare. Thank you very much. Uh, it probably won't surprise you that there are many people in this virtual audience with a strong interest in, in data and in, evalu in evaluation. Um, and so I think we've, you know, there's questions focusing specifically on primary care, on long-term care, on other areas, but um, also some just gem general interest in maybe for the, given the limits of time we have left, um, if you could speak to whether you see any particular areas of pressing need when it comes to knowledge gaps that we have and what we need to know more about or understand better in order to shape our sort of go forward uh, 
health policy interventions around increasing equity of care. Yeah, thanks, Amy. And, and, and again, it's, it's genuine for me about the honor of being able to, to give this talk and have this discussion, because I think one of the pieces that I hopefully to try to reiterate is actually the importance. It's not to pour cold water on the importance of evaluation and program evaluation and research. I think it is so vital uh, to be able to inform a lot of the advocacy, a lot of this push for change, and being in a room here with many who have for a long time contributed or starting to get into this work with a lot of passion, uh, I think it is incredibly important. Now, I did you know, cite a few papers that were um, quantitative or randomized control trials, and I'm not a trialist, so this was not to uh, you know, promote my own work. Uh, but I really do think in terms of where there's some real pressing gaps, my bias is that we need more mixed methods research. The qualitative pieces are so important. When we're talking about the voices that are in play. I think the my hope is that the future of health services research, and especially around the policy intersections, really are mixed, ensuring that the qualitative and patient experience and, and person stories are really central to the, the work that's happening. I think for a long time, we have not engage with patient partners, not engage with communities about what research questions are actually important to them. Uh, I've seen some really important shifts over the last five years, I have to say, uh, especially again with some indigenous colleagues of teaching about how to ensure that none of this is tokenistic, but uh, these um, discussions and this engagement has to come from the outset. I think we have for too long had seen uh, people try to game grant processes to say, well, okay, at the end, you need a uh, a certain box so will go to someone to tick it off. Uh, that's not actually advancing the research and the questions. And so I think uh, that element of seeing some amazing work from researchers engaging communities at the, uh, the upfront, at the outset. And I think that's the way we have to move. And I think listening to our communities is going to be so powerful as to where we want to actually uh, move our um, research interests and research dollars. I mean, I said this, and again, with full respect for my colleagues on the randomized control trial uh, for pharmacare, and I only feel the ability to say it because now Prasad is such a superb researcher in person. Uh, the fact that we had to do a randomized control trial to answer something that communities already knew and to spend millions of dollars and to show the outcome, I think it, it shows just how far back we are on these issues. So I think where you can as a either early career researcher or wherever you're at in your career uh, to be able to partner with uh, communities or people with experience, I think will be so rich for the kind of work and evaluative work that you do. Uh, and I think um, we really need to show more humility in the hospital sector and research side uh, and better understanding, you know, what the challenges people are facing, but also I hope it goes back to this theme, the innovations and learnings that can take place. And I think we need to get away from this real medical colonial view that we always know what's going to be right, but we have to make this decision about where we're going to move the system. Well, we allowed that to happen for 50 years since the lawn. I don't think we've made the advancements that are fair to any uh, of the communities that we work with. And so I hope that's a real shift that happens with this cohort and the next generation of uh, policy scholars. Oh, well, thank you for that. And I'm very sorry to say that this brings us to the end of our question period. My deep apologies to all of you for whose questions I was not able to get to. I do wanna thank you for your engagement and, and thank you so much, Dr. Wuzri, for your really thoughtful and insightful responses. Um, I will turn the floor back now to Dr. Bond, but as I do so, I, I hope I can take a moment of moderator's um, privilege here. And, and there is one question I'd love to just pose to you as I transfer the floor. And it comes from the perspective of our students. We have many graduate students who come to us, many of whom like Dr. Bond are working either within the healthcare sector or in the public service. And they come to our graduate programs in health administration, public administration, or public policy because they have a passion for being part of making the system work better. Uh, and one wondering if you have any parting words of advice or insights to share with them as we wrap up today. I, I was say bless what you do, you know, and I remember it, you know, in terms of being uh, drawn to wanting to go into policy and policy research. And I, I think, you know, again, I'm biased, but I think it's the most compelling area. And if I thought it was, you know, an area that needed to happen 10 years ago, I think you're going into it at a time where it's needed more than ever. Um, your ingenuity, your talent, your passion to these issues. These are the things that are really driving life and death. And I think for a long time, we've seen some of the social policy or public policy issues, uh, as Amy and others have, have mentioned in the chat, 
that are distant to health and healthcare and health and well-being. Um, and I think it's it's your work that's actually going to help center so many of these discussions. Uh, and I think the other you know element um, in terms of looking at um, you know any advice, I would just say you know it it to be able to step back at times to see what are your key metrics or key values going to be so much of this in academia or coming through policy, people will impose and tell you what they see as a measure of success. People will tell you what they see as the requirements for promotion or advancement. And I think, unfortunately, so many of us had to reckon with that in the pandemic that it may have actually been more advantageous from a career perspective for me to be publishing RCTs during the pandemic rather than maybe working alongside folks in community around a vaccine rollout. That may not have a way to be captured by universities or various employers, but I think as long as you can try to protect and will that time to see what you feel is going to be impact, not just about the impact of journals and various algorithms, um, I hope you can really find the meaning in the work and the meaning in the evaluations and advocacy that you're going to put out that will will drive this to be sustainable. Because I know that there were many dark periods in the last few years where many of us, and again, if I didn't have friends and colleagues like Angela Roberts and others to say, you know, we have to push on hope. We have to push, even if policymakers aren't listening to either the evidence or shared experience or stories, um, it becomes that much harder if you can't be able to protect what it is that you want to see as your key performance metric, as what you think is valuable to you and to your community as the kind of work that you want to advance. And I know that that's not always the case is there's an array of incentives, an array of requirements uh, to sort of deem who's successful and who's not. And I hope you can get some time uh, to reflect or protect that in your journey. Thank you. Over to you, Andrew. Andrew Bond. Thanks so much. Uh, and thank you, uh, Andrew, Dr. Bazzari, uh, for what I think, I hope everybody will agree was an absolutely necessary talk and a necessary topic for us all to be looking at and not turning our eyes away from the data, the information, the, the need that is before us and the task at hand and to Dr. Berwick's language, as you shared, um, the need for mass mobilization to do something about this right now and to Dr. Shazeshni for facilitating this discussion today. Thank you so much for this and all the time together through the MHA program. That's been such a great part of my career development. I think what stood out for me probably more than anything else tonight, and I have have the, the the great privilege of getting to spend lots of time with Dr. Buzari here in our work together in, in Toronto, um, is I think hearing maybe more than ever um, tonight or this afternoon, the need to bring together our desperate need and truly desperate need for innovation in the public healthcare system in Medicare, along with equity to inform that innovation and the role that governance plays in ensuring that stewardship happens in a way that not only is in a good way from a ethics and equity perspective, but that that is inextricable, inextricable from the actual effectiveness of innovation itself. And seeing these as not two different things that must be married, but actually intrinsically connected at their at their root between equity and innovation and, and, and sort of expressed through governance. So I think I heard that loud and clear. And thank you for that. I think that's critical as we look to try to strive through what is right now some very dark days in healthcare for all of us with immense work to do um, in the coming days, months, and years. Before I conclude the annual fifth annual Houston lecture, I'm pleased to remind everybody that this lecture was recorded and, and it will be posted on the site very shortly once edited. Um, and also for those who are interested in learning about other events, there's uh, some information I think that'll be shared around where to access that. Maybe we can put that in the chat. Um, and maybe what I'll do is just do a quick link because I think the next um, speaker on October 19th uh, for the Robertson lecture has a very important connection to what we've heard and talked about today. Jennifer Kiesmat, uh, who was Toronto city planner um, and a mayoral candidate, um, I think recalls the fact that public health really has a root deeply tied in city planning and healthcare. And the idea that we need to, to I think Dr. Buzari's point here around a prescription for partnership, potentially around the P of partnership, um, 
any of the bold moves of city building, planning, infrastructure, and how we build for health in, in our rebuilding process. There's a deep connection to city planning, and so it'll be hopefully great for everybody to uh, connect this talk to, to that one as well. I want to thank once again uh, our speakers, Dr. Jashni, uh, as a facilitator, Dr. Guzari, and for introductions, uh, Lodine, Dr. Lodine Burdall. Thank you so much. And the members of the Houston Lecture Committee, thank you for all that you've done to help prepare this event today. Particular thanks to the Houston family for making this event possible. That's been so important for all of us at a time that is just so necessary. And last but not least, to all of you who joined us this afternoon, hope you found the conversation compelling, relevant, and so necessary, as I said. Thank you, and hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks so much. Appreciate it.